Stuart, you and I have both had a 40-year odyssey with consciousness. Uh, tell me what you think consciousness is. Well, you know, Robert, there was once a conference that decided before they could explain consciousness, they had to define it. Uh -huh. They spent the entire week trying to define it, never got to explaining <laughs> it. What I think it is, is awareness. Now, that's another word, but it means having phenomenal experience, having subjective first-person experience of the world outside or the internal world. We can also generate internal states of consciousness. It's having this experience. It differs from behavior, which can be non-conscious, a difference from uh, memory, which can be non-conscious, uh, attention, it differs from. It's having an awareness, a subjective phenomenal experience of something, of the world out there or something inside of us. So what are some examples? Of the world outside, I'm looking at you, I'm looking at the scene here at La Costa, it's beautiful. Uh, also, if I close my eyes, or even if I don't, if I'm, uh, if my mind wanders, I think about my, uh, what I'm going to do at the hospital the next day if I'm going to work, or what I'm going to do here at the conference, or uh, uh, memories, uh, my family, uh, experiences, why my team uh, can't win a game, or something like that. So it can be memory, internally generated states. It has some kind of awareness that comes into, uh, it, it just becomes uh, what I am experiencing at that moment. Now, this I is... Think this is the most natural thing that we have, and yet when you look at it philosophically, scientifically, it becomes the most bizarre thing in existence. The closer you look at it, the harder it is to explain. Now, I think that consciousness is a sequence of discrete events, a sequence of moments. This goes back to ancient Buddhists who were able to time the number of conscious moments in a 24-hour period at about six and a half million, and that turns out to be right in the gamma synchrony range, about 50 to 90 hertz. Gamma is 30 to 90. That's how many times a second? 30 to 90 times a second, uh, like frames in a movie, except in a movie or video, there's an observer, an external observer. These frames have consciousness built in. The frames themselves have consciousness, have the observer as part of them. And I, I, I think that consciousness is a sequence of discrete moments. What's your justification for that? Well, it goes back to Whitehead, William James, ancient Buddhism, the uh, perceptual moment theory, and there's no really better alternative. You can't say it's a property of matter, it's a, it's a state, it's a sequence of discrete events. Whitehead, the process philosopher, said that consciousness was a, uh, a series of occasions of experience occur occurring in a wider field of proto-conscious experience. And I think that fits with, ancient, with Vedanta and with modern science. So I think that's the best bet. So how does it fit with modern science? Gamma synchrony EEG uh, is the best marker of consciousness, the best correlate of consciousness, which is 30 to 90 hertz. So that and means uh, that every second... Uh, there are 30 to 90, and now it looks like 130 to 200 events per second. And that's that, why the EEG looks very, very uh, Yes, the EEG is a mixture of those with other uh, right. frequencies. Um, but uh, gamma, uh, the high frequency end, seems to correlate best with conscious awareness. For example, under anesthesia, the high frequency goes away and we're left with the low. Uh, the brain is quite active under anesthesia. All that really goes away, uh, it's fairly selective, is, is consciousness. Uh, perception... Uh, you know not, something about anesthesia? I'm an anesthesiologist. I've been doing it for 38 years. <laughs> Uh, passing gas, as we say, <laughs> and in a very busy trauma hospital. It's demanding. It's, uh, it's extremely uh, uh, challenging, but still interesting. After all these years, I still love it. I enjoy going to work. And uh, every day when I put my patients to sleep, I wonder, well, you know, where are they going? But the real question is, where, why are they there in the first place? Why are we conscious? And how do the anesthetic drugs work? And I've studied quite a bit about how anesthetic drugs work, and, and that plays into the theories I have about consciousness. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what do you see as the role of the study and the thought about consciousness in today's world, today's science world? How, how central is it? How important? It used to be really a peripheral subject to science. When the behaviorists took over psychology at the beginning of the 20th century after William James, they wanted to bring study of the mind into science, and you can't measure consciousness. It can't be measured or observed, much like a quantum system. So they got rid of it. They studied behavior, Skinner boxes, learning memory, mazes, things that you could quantify and measure, and consciousness became a dirty word. It was tossed out of science, literally. In the late 80s, however, a few people came out, uh, notable people, Roger Penrose wrote The Emperor's New Mind, uh, Francis Crick had won a Nobel Prize uh, for DNA, and uh, Gerald Edelman, who also won a Nobel Prize, started talking about consciousness. So that's it made it uh, somewhat respectable, uh, mostly in neuroscience, although Roger brought in physics. And of course, in, in uh, uh, Indian, Eastern approaches, they've been talking about it for a while. Philosophy and philosophy been uh, talking about it with Thomas Nagel's What Is It Like to Be a Bat? But in the early 90s, it all came together where we, we started to have interdisciplinary uh, approaches where the quantum physicists could talk to the Eastern philosophers, philosophers and the 
and, and the neuroscientists and the cognitive sciences and, and try to bridge these gaps and, and make sense of, of a very difficult question. Yeah, it seems like in, though, in many cases the, the different parties get more entrenched in their own, <laughs> in their own uh, uh, attitudes as opposed to coming together in some way. I'm not, I'm not opposed to that because I don't like compromise. I like truth, and sometimes truth has to be uh, harsh. Uh, I'm with you. You know, plus there's the fact that uh, AI, I'm disappointed. the singularity people want to bottle consciousness. They want to uh, sim emulate the brain, simulate the brain. So they make these ridiculous assumptions about how the brain works and say, well, when you have a computer can do that, it'll be conscious. So uh, that gets into politics and money and funding and so forth. And I think that's taking us away from where we really need to go. I think we need to go deeper inside the neuron into the cytoskeleton, as you know, where, where my interests lie. Right. And so uh, how would you look at what, what I'd call the orders of magnitude in terms of how consciousness is viewed from uh, the, uh, the, the subcellular level, which you do, to the uh, neural circuits and even to the philosophical? W w what's the spectrum of attack on consciousness? Most people look at the brain as uh, 100 billion nerve cells, each acting like switches or bits in a computer. And when they interact by, at synapses at, with enough complexity and perform computation that's complex enough, consciousness emerges, voila, at a critical level. However, they've never specified a threshold. They've never specified why that happens. They've never said how much complexity is enough for consciousness. Why a system like a, like a weather pattern or the great red spot of Jupiter, which is complex and self-organized, isn't consciousness. Why the, the, the World Wide Web isn't conscious, although some people are forced to say it is because they're taking that position. So complexity theory, where you have a high level of network interactions, I don't think does it. Um, but I think that it's a clue because if you look at the dynamics at the network level, for example, in the EEG, uh, there's fractal self-similarity. So if you go down in scale from very slow EEG to faster EEG and look at, at a particular uh, length of time and blow it up, you see the same, sort of the same patterns, like a fractal or, or a hologram even. And I've, we've thought about holographic memory for many, many years. So I, it's, it's scale invariance. So it seems like if, if you go down in scale, you get the same sort of patterns, but uh, at a smaller scale, faster, and I think more intense in terms of consciousness. And that would lead you to believe that the, the real generative place of consciousness at, is at lower levels. I think that for other reasons, but uh, most people stop at the level of neurons. But if you think of neurons as simple bits, then you have the problem of explaining a paramecium. A single cell paramecium is one cell has no synapses. It swims around, it finds food, it finds mates, it has sex, it can learn. If you suck it into a capillary tube, it gets out faster each time. And yet it's one cell, it has no synapses. So how would a, a network theorist explain that? They can't. A paramecium does it by using its structures called microtubules inside of it and on its surface, which sense and move it and process information. These same microtubules are found in neurons, in all of our neurons. And I think information processing within the brain goes down inside the neuron to the level of the microtubules, which seem to be perfectly designed uh, computers, in fact, quantum computers.